Welcome back to the Academy Table. I'm Renee De Silva, CEO of the Academy and your host. In this episode, I welcomed Andrew Chastain to the table. Andrew is the president and CEO of Whitkiefer, a global executive search firm with a particular focus in healthcare and life sciences. Our conversation centered on a topic I'm very animated by, and that I also think is often overlooked in equity and inclusion efforts, diversifying and modernizing healthcare boards. There are so many interesting points to note from our time together, but here are a few of my takeaways. First, truly modernizing health system boards is a significant commitment. It will require organizations to change how they search for new board members, like reducing the reliance on personal networks and geographic convenience. It also means updating existing policies, including the frequency of meetings and introducing age and term limits. But as we discuss, These changes will lead to a more diverse, inclusive board that's better positioned for success. Next, I loved Andrew's suggestions for individuals interested in board service. As he says, candidates should know why you're wanted and ask specifically what the board views as your expertise. This can be especially helpful for candidates from diverse backgrounds who want to rightfully avoid feeling like they just checked a box. And lastly, We ended our discussion more broadly on the hallmarks of a successful CEO. Andrew points to creative and courageous thinking and leveraging good processes that encourage bold action. So with that, let's head to the table. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us at the table. Happy to have you here today. It's great to be here, Renee. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So you and I have gotten a chance to know each other across the last couple of months. Uh, you serve as the president and CEO at Whit Kiefer, which is an executive search firm. I know that you also spend time on leadership effectiveness. And so I look forward to having a broad conversation with you today. I'm looking forward to it as well. So let's start with just how you arrived in search. What was your path to your current role? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking, Renee. I, I uh, actually started as a client of our firm's I Worked in hospital administration at an academic health science center in Chicago, where I had a portion of the house that I supported the operations of. And then as part of that role, I supported the searches across the organization as the new leadership team was being brought in and really enjoyed. I mean, I loved working in healthcare. But I loved this intersection of of talent, strategy, and operations. And so when our firm was opening an office a couple of years later, I was recruited in as a, what I refer to as an inexperienced assistant to, uh, <laughs> to help cope with the development of the office here in Atlanta. And so have been here for 24 years. That's great. And Whit Kiefer as an organization, I know that you all spend about 60% or greater on healthcare. Do I have that right? That's correct. Yes. So what I'd love to maybe explore is the 40% that you spend outside of healthcare. Where do you think there might be some interesting lessons for the provider or healthcare community in that? And I guess I'd ask you to maybe particularly talk about what you observe from non-healthcare, maybe publicly traded or for-profit entities on how they think about governance and, and search holistically. Yeah, so they tend to use executive search or look outside of their comfort zones when they're looking for uh, new governance members. So those that we serve who... I would say follow best practices, have a competency grid that's, that is when they're looking for, for new governance members, they have a process and they have a, a, a competency grid that they work against. And so the process is that they have normal turnover. They have a nominations and governance committee that is responsible for, for obviously nominating new members. And they use the competency grid to look broadly and how, how do they fill the gaps that they see inside the competencies of the organization and those can include things like strategic planning, cybersecurity, uh, marketing, diversity, equity and inclusion. And it's really a, a very thoughtful process about how do we diversify our competency skills, the demographic makeup of the boards, whereas uh, we tend to see our hospital and health system clients, rely on a more traditional way of identifying talent for the next generation of governance, be that through personal networks or particularly looking uh, inside their own uh, geographic spaces. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I spend a fair amount of my own time with our our chief executive officer group. And I, I think there is this sort of beginning reckon just reconciliation around that we we need to as an industry think about how we seed and prepare our boards differently. And so you mentioned a couple of things that you feel like might be in that that best practice bucket, the competency piece of it, broadening the network a bit to make sure that you're not just going to the folks that you may know. Are there other things that you've seen shift over time that you feel like would sort of be on that list of sort of best in class ways of approaching it? Yeah, I think a couple of things I would add, you know, beyond self-referral, because I think when we when we look at self-referral or identifying through our own networks, we tend to, to end up with people who are, I'm doing my finger quotes, like us, so who, who more think like us or look like us or approach problem solving like us. And so when you look, when you are able to get outside of that self-referral, you're more likely to get diversity of thought and the diversity of, of, of demographics on your board. So I think getting beyond just self-referrals, I think opening it up beyond just your ge- geographic limitations. Now, I realize that some organizations have that in their bylaws, I would highly recommend they they um, uh, reevaluate those so that they can get f- uh, folks from outside of the geographic uh, limitations. I think a lack of compensation limits your ability to find uh, some talent that would be more interested should they be compensated for their time. I, I think, Renee, also the, the time requirements and over governance that many health systems suffer from where they are creating more work by meeting more often than they need to. So another comparison would be most organizations we serve outside of hospitals and health systems meet on a quarterly basis versus a monthly basis, Mm -hmm. which forces them really to uh, only talk about strategic topics, not really operational topics. And I think if you're able to pitch that to a really great potential board member, you're um, more likely to be able to hook them uh, on on their service than if they're meeting every month and have a you know 200 page board book to read. Yeah, I think those are all good. The other things that that I've noted from folks that I feel like have really been trying to be more progressive around this, in addition to what you mentioned too, is then looking at their their policies around governance that maybe make that hard. So, do they have term limits? I know that some outside of healthcare boards actually have age limits, right? So they're trying to get a a demographic lens that I think the majority of board members, something like 60% tend to be 60 and and, and higher or older. And so I think you're right. It's both of how do I actually think about approaching my new board searches in different and kind ways? And also, are there any existing policies that I have in place that make that harder to do? Yes, I think term limits are, are critically important. And it's remarkable how often we run into organizations that don't have term limits. One quick story, I had met with a board. Luckily, I can say this was a few years ago that the chair of the uh, board and the vice chair had been on the board for 40 years. And the person they were trying to prepare to be the next board chair had been on the board for only 26 so my question was, at what point do you think they'll be ready? But that's not uncommon. And so you know, that is the most basic of best practices is having term limits to have in place and to staggering the t- those terms to make sure that you're, you're opening up the, the, the to a diversity of thought and diversity of demographics on your team, on your governance team. Yeah, that's interesting. Just staying with that for a moment. I, I was meeting with a, a- friend of the Academy recently, a current CEO, and and his sentiment, which I thought was so interesting, was if you think about the role of governance, oftentimes what you want that that trustee to do is operate sort of as a as a independent sort of thinker. And one of the things that he mentioned that maybe sometimes becomes a challenge is if you think about the currency that not-for-profit boards sort of exchange in, it's 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 less about stakeholder value in traditional terms. It's often about independence and board seats. And so you can sort of see how that maybe sometimes makes it harder to really move performance or to be provocative on the direction of the organization when ultimately, based on a lot of the things that we're talking about, what people really value, the trustees on the board can sometimes value is independence and how do board seats come together. So I, I think your, your point is very well taken. Correct, correct. And, and, I, and I know that most of the CEOs that, we're, that we work with are really trying to update 
the best practices of their board and uh, educate them on on what those look like and but ultimately it's it's not the CEO's responsibility it's the board's responsibility for holding it to specific accountabilities around these things. I mean, to hold, I mean, because they man, we can provide support as a CEO, you can provide support to the board, but the board is ultimately responsible for how does it govern itself? And that's a you know, really interesting dynamic, particularly when a CEO who is you know, inter- interfacing with other CEOs about the needs to diversify their, their governance and, and have good governance, but they're not ultimately responsible for implementing it they're responsible for supporting it and it's a it's a really interesting dynamic when you report to that body yeah that is right you're serving at the pleasure of the board in some ways and so how do you have influence on that body while keeping all this ground and afoot so that makes a ton of sense let's talk a bit more about some of the extrinsic factors that we've all seen across the last 18 months and so as it relates to equity and inclusion as a country we've had a bit of a reckoning and I know when you and I've chatted in the past I think there is much more of an acknowledgement of the need to be much, to be more intentional around diversifying the board. We've seen Goldman Sachs come out maybe about a year ago saying that any company that they sort of take public would have at least two members of the board that were that represented a, a diverse audience. We've seen NASDAQ asking SEC for permission to do something around having greater parity around gender and race. So that there's there's extrinsic factors that are kind of converging around having our boards look like our countries right? Like having much more, much, much greater representation. Despite that, we've seen some movement, or maybe I'll ask you this question. With those extrinsic factors happening, have you seen progress and momentum around that? Like that can be yet measured in outcomes? Are we still in early innings around that? We're still early in the game. I, I, I would say every search that we're involved in or every board that we support uh, is genuinely interested in diversifying their their governance structures. I, I mean, it's just, it is happening both from the external factors that you mentioned that are requiring it, but also to the accountability to the communities that they serve, be them uh, community not-for-profit organizations or organizations who are have uh, stakeholders as uh, uh, defined by the leadership advisory group. I mean, it's Everyone feels the pressure to to meet these um, requirements, and we. I uh, don't know that I've mentioned this to you, but I participate on the McKinsey and Company Black Leadership Academy program, and I teach a couple of classes through this. And one that I teach is how Black executives can prepare for board seats. We've graduated over two thousand executives in the last year from that program, and there are so there's a whole generation of folks who are becoming aware of what is it like to serve on boards and how do I prepare myself for this? But having been introduced to you know, all 2000, and what are their backgrounds and so forth? They're very different than your traditional candidate who lives in your community and runs a business in your community. Uh, oftentimes they are a functional leader inside of a big multinational organization and, and, and they would provide extreme value to an organization. But if you're looking for that traditional prototype or of the local business leader who's civic minded and, and has influence in that community, you're going to have to look beyond that to be able to, to, to help to diversify your governance structures. I think that's an excellent point. What that also just points to is there is talent that is available that may not be visible and so, or as visible as, as maybe we'd like. And so I, I think programs like that are incredibly powerful and just sort of Great, creating greater visibility to where the talent pipeline exists. Oh, I, I, it, it does exist. It just will look different. And so, if you're if you want the, your board to be full of CEOs or former CEOs who have the time to meet monthly and have committee meetings all the time, that's you're, you're probably going to have to change the way that you um, look at uh, the commitments to be on your board, or that can give uh, a lot of money. Because some of this is um, you're going to have more up and comers, which you'd have greater age diversity as well. But when you're when you're looking at how do you tap in, I think you said that there's availability, but maybe not visibility. How you're tapping into to that, particularly as you look beyond your local community, there are 
resources that exist. I mean, you can access talent outside of sort of your traditional board network. One way is to tap into networks like the NACD or the National Association of Corporate Directors. I mean, that, that is an organization that specifically caters to developing the, the, the capabilities and, and uh, responsibilities of board members. But you can bet that if you're nominating governance chair is participating in that as well, they would be sitting alongside of other potential board members and you can look to, to find skill sets outside of that. Absolutely. I'd also add in terms of the, the organizations that really are focused on this, the Leverage Network is another organization that does a lot around advancing leadership for people of color. I think of Executive Leadership Council as another source for that. So uh, the way that I've historically thought about that, just like anytime you are recruiting for anything, you will always be better served in terms of building connective tissue in advance of need. And I think if folks who are investing in that, and I know that you spend some personal time there, I think you generally then when you when you have a near-term role to fill, whether that's a board role or an executive role, you've, you've sort of done the work required to maybe move that along more quickly. Yeah, I think you're also, because there's been so much writing about this issue, you are starting to see executives from outside of the traditional uh, sources begin to wonder how might I be on a board and how do I make myself visible on that board? And and a large part of the McKinsey program that we're talking to them about is really how do you build your uh, brand and your availability to an interest to serve on board? So how do you present yourself and make yourself visible uh, to use your word, Renee? And and, uh, how do you make organizations that might be interested in you and why would a board want you? And, and you need to define this and promote it. And, and I always tell in that class that interest and, uh, and uh, presence can't be your differentiator. Mm. And just because you're interested in being on a board and just because you're there uh, cannot be the reasons that, 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 that someone would choose you. What is your elevator speech of why you should serve on the board, I think is a really critical thing that we're trying to help uh, these folks think about and how they promote themselves. So let's stay on that because I know that's a a personal um, passion of yours. You recently wrote a LinkedIn article around what are the steps that one can take if they want to prepare themselves for a board seat. And you've talked about some of them, building your brand, the importance of having, having the skills. So instead of investing in some of the training and education that would be, would be needed, what are some other things that you would offer advice for or advice advice around for people who are looking for their maybe first board role? Yeah, uh, sure, Renee. So yeah, in, in addition to sort of uh, building your brand around it, you actually promote yourself a little differently when you're looking for a board seat. So creating a board bio, which is really different than a uh, resume, but it highlights on those things that, that might help you to, to catch the eye of a, of a board beyond just what is your expertise? What are the strengths that you build? And it's, it's just a little bit organized differently than a, than a resume. And then you, you, you need to gauge the, the time commitment that you can put forth into this. The easiest way to get the eye of a, of a corporate board or, or a large health system board is to get involved with a, uh, something that you're passionate about on the not-for-profit side, which allows you to show that you are involved enough, that you're interested enough, and that you can take on leadership inside of a board, because it is hard to convince a public board that that you would be a, a good board member should you not have experiences in what compensation committees do and how do you govern the audit and finance committee and so forth, and how do you evaluate risk at a governance level versus a management level, I think would be, would be really helpful. So starting off small and simple of getting involved in something Another is that you need to clear it with your employer. So it is a big time commitment. Most organizations encourage their uh, senior leadership team to be involved both in their community and with other governance opportunities. However, there are a few of my clients, which are large uh, multinational retailers, if you will, who have so many conflicts of interest that they uh, can't allow their their senior leadership team members to serve on boards. And so you'd want to clear that with HR and compliance before you put your name out there. And then you want to know why you're wanted. Mm. So this is a really important thing, I think, particularly for candidates who come from uh, underrepresented minority backgrounds in that 
you want to know that the organization is looking at your skills and experiences as much as they are looking at you for your the diverse background that you might bring. Uh, unless you're comfortable with that being the reason that they're most interested in you, because what like on, on my board, I have diversity and I've not chosen to have an executive on my leadership team or my uh, governance team who is diverse to lead my diversity, equity, inclusion council, because he comes actually comes from an accounting background. So mm. he's much more involved in the accounting pieces, but he does bring diversity of thought and diversity of experiences to the board as we're making strategic decisions. But if a board is wanting an individual to be there to represent diversity, equity, inclusion, but they come from a legal or compliance background, it could present an awkward future if that's the case. And so I always make sure that candidates ask that question about what is it about me and why should I want to be on this board? I love that, both from the perspective of wanting to just be thoughtful around how you pull together a sort of a cohesive team to drive an agenda or strategy forward and also not requiring that the BIPOC individual has to be the carrier of the flag on issues that really all of us as an executive and as humans need to own. I think that's a really important point that you make around how to think about that. I also wonder, so I, I, I serve on two boards outside of the Academy board right now. And, and the one piece, and I think I learned this from you when we, when we spoke beginning of this year is not to underestimate the time commitment. So what is your rule of thumb for number of hours of preparation required for every one hour of a board meeting? Well, I, I, I would say at least eight, to be honest with you, it is a lot of work. You have to, for, that is for every hour you're in the boardroom, I think it's about eight hours of prep work, committee work, and all of these kinds of things. So it is a considerable amount of time. But I think if you're the, the, the chair of a board, you're probably looking at 20% of your time. And so it's hard to, to, to have a full-time job and be the chair of a board. Mm-hmm. It, it, is, it is difficult. But I think it's four to eight hours of time that you're going to spend reading through, traveling to. And so that's why we strongly encourage our boards to only meet quarterly. I know many of our clients' boards meet monthly, and I just think that's too much. It forces yeah. you to only focus on the critical strategic uh, decisions that the board has to make. You can do a lot of other work in committees that now with Zoom, uh, we're capable of doing. We're encouraging our clients to meet at least half of those board meetings live starting in calendar year 2022. I think that's great. And then the only other thing that comes up for me as you were talking, reflecting on your, from an individual lens would be, just to not underestimate how your domain knowledge can apply in other settings or industry, right? So this notion of if you have a passion for talent and you've, if you've run big orgs around talent and strategy and operations, that's a little bit of my background, that can be applied in healthcare and consumer products and government contracting. Like there is some fungibility and skill set that if you think with a governance hat on, you may open yourself up to opportunities that you might not otherwise know existed. I actually think that's a real positive. When, when we're trying to recruit folks in, we look for people outside of the industry more often than we look for people inside the industry. And, and we think that that diversity of thought, if you're, if you're recruiting for you know, healthcare startup and, and you've got one we want um, certain competencies and skills, say legal or m a or something like that, but to recruit someone in, someone in from retail that has those ex- experiences, I think actually helps the organization. So now they'd have to be committed to learning about commercial healthcare and, and they need to understand the industry that they're serving. But I think recruiting them in from from without coming from from outside of the industry is, is a real plus. I agree. Maybe one other question on, on, on board and governance before I move us to just a broader leadership topic, but we've spent a lot of our time talking about how to assess your board needs, how to find the right board members, ensure that you've got, you've modernized your board practices. Maybe the one other area that you might be able to comment on is then how do you then make sure that those boards are successful? My other observation is that the, the wet, whether to the extent to which board members gel and that environment itself feels inclusive and safe, and you can have constructive debate with respect really matters. I don't know if you've seen any examples of when that 
has really been powerful in action or maybe just advice for people who are thinking about, okay, I'm now excited about the board that I have in place. How do I ensure that they are, that we're all working together productively? Well, I think this is actually a role that the CEO can help with. So the CEO should work in tandem with the, the chair and, and either the vice chair, however you're structured, vice chair or immediate past chair, to make sure that the boardroom feels like a place where people can, can speak up in a safe uh, zone, uh, that they can share their thoughts and they can feel like they contribute, or they're not going to want to be there or they're not going to contribute in any way. So I, I think having a self-assessment is a really valuable tool. Best practices are that a board should assess itself every year, and that should include how we set agendas, how we interface with each other, how effective governance is, how effective is management for updating and informing the board on the topics that need to be discussed. I think all of those are, are really helpful. I also have seen where outside facilitators can come in and, and lead a, an exercise in how functional a board is. I participated in one about a year and a half ago that was really, really valuable. And some things came out about people's willingness to speak up or w- willingness to disagree with strong voices in the room. Mm. And it was a cleansing experience for that board. I mean, it was things were shared in there that had never been shared before. And so I think that would be hard to facilitate by yourself, but having a a, a really deft outside facilitator to lead through some of those sensitive topics, because that board, as I've watched, has really advanced in their openness of consideration. And then it's led to a better decision-making and as important, more support for the decisions that they make in that room because they all felt like they were heard. Absolutely, which then should translate into better outcomes for stakeholders, whether that's patients or communities or however that board defines their stakeholder group. I think that's really powerful. Agreed. So I would be remiss if we didn't cover one other broad category, which is as we are talking to our members, and I, I when I asked, I asked a question recently, you had a recent board retreat. What were the what were the the main points that you wanted to cover with your board in terms of just real things that you're worried about? And the answer was workforce, workforce, and workforce. <laughs> Yeah, And so, as you know, I think in almost every sector, this, whether it's the great resignation sentiment or just the challenge in people feeling like they are just really at the point of a break in terms of just how overworked people feel, the need for executives to constantly be replenished and, and sort of keep the teams together. Just what conversations are you seeing your peers across the industry and your, your clients as it relates to workforce? Well, it, it is the topic. Just in your experiences, I was at a meeting with about a dozen health system CEOs, and it was, we spent the majority of our time talking about this item, testing for who has ideas on how we can address the the needs, because no technology is going to uh, be enter, is going to enter the market that's going to solve this. At at, at the end of the day, care is hands-on patients, right? And so how can we help to do that? And there's no easy solution. The, the entire industry is trying to solve it together. The, having traveler nurses, as it's not just the expense side, it is all of the, the cultural issues that, that happen when you've got a large uh, interim workforce inside working alongside people who've stuck with you for a long time and know that they could be making more money if they traveled. And so I wish I, I came back from that meeting and reached out to our entire workforce at Wikifor to say, does anyone have solutions to this? And I, I hate, Renee, that I can't say, here's two things that I've seen work. I have seen some Uber-style apps that people are, are putting into the, the search process for, for, for travelers, make that process more efficient, but it is not solving the systemic problems of, of, of a workforce that is more transient. And I, and I wish I had a silver bullet for you on this one, but, but there isn't one that I've been able to identify. Yeah. It feels that way. You know, folks that have been um, in this healthcare domain for 30, 40 plus years would say that they've not quite seen a set of circumstances quite as challenging on the workforce. Now, if, if I were to wear a glass half full view is I, I think we're, we might start to see ways that we tap into parts of our population that have been underemployed and really have to invest in skill building far afield of the need. So lots of conversation in our circles around how do I, how do I think through 
high school kids and make it easier for them to get a skilled role within healthcare? And how do I think through more credentialed programs and maybe reduce the complexity of them being able to be ready to sort of serve in the field? And how do I reach back out to moms who may have wanted to take a pause, given that's all that's been going on and invite them back into the workforce? So I guess my hope in all of this is that we are able to rising tide lift all boats and tap into parts of the market that may have not may not have been on our radar quite as much. I, I think that those are great ideas, Renee. And I think that everyone's so focused on filling the shift today that if 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 some entrepreneurs could come up with what are some solutions that are two, three years down the road, five years down the road, and really start to build towards that, it would be extremely helpful to the health system of the United States. So it's just, we're at this extreme pressure point looking for solutions. Agree. Related to this, but maybe now getting back to the executive lens, and this will maybe be my last question before our wrap up, but You've got this privileged position where you see CEOs in particular come and you see them go and you probably have a beat on how effective they've been in that duration. So if you draw upon your collective view of sort of CEO effectiveness in particular, what comes out for you as to the folks that have been in that role that feel differentiated from the rest? Wow, what a great question. So I would, I think the ones that I think really differentiate themselves are those that are creative and have great courage. Mm. So the ones who don't try to look for patterns and say, well, this worked for me in my last job, let's try and make it work here. But instead use what allowed me to come up with a creative solution in the last role? And would that process maybe produce similar creative solutions here? So so those are the ones that I think really change organizations and, and, and get out of the group think of, well, they're doing this in that organization and they have a great brand. We should try that here. So So creativity and then the courage to implement those things that are different and courage is really easy to admire and very hard to administer. Mm -hmm. It's easy to look back and say, wow, she was incredibly courageous when she did that uh, and admire that. But the administration of sitting there going, I could take the easy road with less risk, or take this creative road with more risk, and I'm going to take the risky road. I love that. Really something. And and I think it differentiates people. Yeah, for sure. The other piece of advice that I've, I I also feel like I've got a, a good platform for observing really successful CEOs that are running health systems and running large industry companies. And a few things that have landed for me recently, uh, would be high tolerance for complexity and comfort with ambiguity and not letting those things get in the way of this sort of courageous creative action. I I would absolutely agree with you. I think let less linear thinking and sort of looking for creative solutions and having the courage to implement them, I think would, would serve our industry well. I agree. All right. One final question on a much lighter note. So we, the sort of thinking behind launching the Academy table is this notion of one of our core beliefs as an organization is that there's power in curating conversation. You've got the right people around the table. You just get to ideas, actions, outcomes in a, in a pretty special way. So if you could invite any two people for a conversation at your personal table, who would they be and why? Hmm. Interesting question. Again, uh, you're full of them today. (laughs) Uh, So I'll go back to that your last question where you said, so what are the things that I, I admire most about leaders? And I, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated with creativity and courage. So I just talked about them. And so if I, I'm presuming I can invite anybody from any time period. Yes. Indeed. So da, da Vinci would be at my table. I, I read Walter Isaacson's book on Da Vinci. And I was just blown away by his merging of art and science and I don't believe you have to be an artist to be creative. 
I, I recently read a book called How to Write a Song by Jeff Tweedy, who's the front man for a band called Wilco. But he, they are trying to implement not just creativity into how do you write a song, but how do you run a how do you run the business? How do you produce shows? And that creativity, um, I mean, I'd love to ask Da Vinci, how did you look at a stone and come up with a, a statue? Uh, yeah. Would be really interesting to me. Uh, and you know, if I'm looking for courage, as I mentioned earlier. How could you not have Rosa Parks sit around the table and say it, it came down to a decision in a moment? What was going through your mind when you refused to move? And what was the calculus there? I, I just, that would be fascinating. So without a lot of thought, those would be two that I would find great inspiration from. I love that. That was a great response. Well, thank you. It's been, I could, I could go on for another hour or so with you. These topics animate me and it's your life's work quite literally. So I, I appreciate you joining us today and, and it would love to continue the conversation at some point in the future. I would as well, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me at the table. The table is a podcast produced by the health management Academy. Make sure you catch future episodes by visiting our website, theacademytable.com, or by subscribing on the podcast platform of your choice. And if you have suggestions for topics or guests, I'd love to hear from you. Please drop me a note at renee at hmacademy.com. I look forward to talking with you soon.